Oh God, bless Jess as he brings the message this morning, giving illumination to the scriptures and insight and application for our daily Christian journey. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Barbara. Anyone else sensing the good spirit, God's spirit in this space with the variety of things going on this morning? Thank you. Prairie Bronze Handbell Ensemble. I was moved this morning, and I'm not always moved by handbell choirs, to be ensembles, um, to be honest. And I want to say thank you to Barbara for prayer and for worship leading. And you all need to know Barbara is a new member of the caring team and is serving in that role now, and appreciate that greatly. Thank you, Danae. Now I've got to stare at these Hershey kisses. If they stay there, I'll certainly help myself. I heard the, us sing with the music team, For God So Loved Us. Bring your failures and addictions. We all have issues. And I feel like the good spirit, God's spirit moving here among us this morning is a place where we can bring our stuff and we can have God meet us with what we're doing. And just a note, um, anyone else appreciate the worship service last week with the JYF leading? Anyone else appreciate that? It was beautiful. Yeah. And I want to acknowledge that there's a lot of moving parts this morning. There's, there's many people who are contributing with the potluck meal. Plenty of people who are contributing with the business meeting have prepped and will continue to do some things. The concert at 3 o'clock, there's been plenty of preparation going on there. And you know, um, I haven't even mentioned the Super Bowl parties that inevitably will happen. And you'll notice I did wear a red shirt. You know, I just want you to know that I, I know what's going on because many of you all know that, you know, in my heart... I root for a different team, and I see Ted Stuckey thinks back there smiling really big. He's a Steeler fan, too. So the first slide I have this morning, I just want to acknowledge that the body of Christ does not consist of one member or one perspective or, or one way of doing things, but of many. And we've experienced that this morning. There's a variety of ways to to connect with God and with community. And it's the variety of members, us, working together that makes the church. Amen? Amen. Who is the church? We are the church. Who is the church? We are the church, functioning together, working together, living together. So, Sue, I'm going to ask you to jump to the, the third slide this morning. I am aware of the time, and I'm going to keep that in mind. So, before looking into this Mark 9 text with the transfiguration, which is it's kind of a mysterious text, but I'm going to ask this question, and I did get in a little trouble for using this picture, by the way. But I want you to pause and think. When... Have you had a mountaintop experience? What were some of those highlights? You know, maybe your mountaintop experience or experiences have included an actual mountain or not. Maybe it had involved a spiritual experience, say at camp, a worship service, another time. Maybe a lot of people were involved or included in your mountaintop experience. Or maybe it was when you were alone. Maybe it was on a trip. And you had some significant experiences. Or per perhaps you were in the comfort of your own home, sitting in a spot that you've sat in many times, and you had 
a taste of a mountaintop experience. Church, you're following what I'm saying here, right? When I'm talking about mountaintop experiences, you all are with me, right? And, and I am encouraging you to think of those stories. Unpack them this week. Share them with people. Share them with your important people. Because I'm a preacher and I'm here standing, I'm going to share a few of mine. Um, there are many as likely you have many, and I encourage you to share. So I remember in high school, attending Swan Lake Christian Camp in Viberg, South Dakota. Some of you might know this place. Or, or for you, maybe you had a significant camp experience. So I especially remember then a beautiful singing worship time with 50 to 100 high school youth. It was meaningful, and it, and it wasn't just singing. There was a, a, a spirit of worship that was powerful that people were really engaged in, and it was real and authentic. And I remember experiencing that as a high schooler and thinking, there is something real to this. Anyone else note a camp-type venue for a, a spiritual experience? Anyone? So, several hands. I also remember at MCUSA convention 2015, two of my adult daughters were back from where they were living and they were volunteering at convention. And I remember one of the worship services, I'm going to say five, 6,000 people standing singing 606, praise God from whom, singing so loud that even my opera singing daughter standing next to me didn't stand out. And feeling not only the, the camaraderie and the sense of community, but the worship and the power of that. That was a mountaintop experience. And then I remember a time. This was after my first wife, Naomi, died in January of 2017. And I went on a leave of, of absence, and, and I was traveling for a month or so. And I remember on that trip... One of the first weeks into the trip, I went for a walk, and it was as if God's Spirit spoke and said, Jess, what would you want me to do for you? And I heard that, you know, from Luke 18, 41, where Jesus asks the blind man, what would you like me to do for you? And then I had to pause, and I had to think about what would that include? And so that leads me to the fourth and last one I'll share of in answer to that question, what did I want the Lord to do for me? May 4th, 2019, it was my wedding with Kendra. And a highlight for me was all five of my kids singing, you make beautiful things out of dust. That was a mountaintop experience for me. So when have you had a mountaintop experience? Recall those. Feel those. Share those. So let's look at Mark 9. In, in this story that Mark recalls, obviously heard from Peter, James, and John uh, in the Mount of what we call the Mount of Transfiguration story. It's interesting this story doesn't make a, a lot of sense. There's mystery and there's question in it. And I take it as it's hard to describe mountaintop experiences sometimes. But there's a couple things I really want you to note. The first one is this next slide. Note what God says in verse 7. God says, this is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. Now, church, you need to understand, this listen here isn't just a casual here, show up and, you know, listen a little bit. This is a deeply rooted hearing deeply 
So much so that it impacts your life. It changes your heart. You're going to obey and do what Jesus says. This is what this listen means here. It's not a casual, okay, I showed up. I listened to the worship music and the, the sermon. But it's a deep listen. Church, are you, are we listening, obeying, doing what Jesus says? Secondly, in this story here in Mark 9, I believe this story confirms the uniqueness and greatness of Jesus as God's son. And church, that's huge. Don't minimize or diminish the authority and the power and the importance of Jesus. When you do, if you do, you diminish what God is trying to do in us, in our world, in society. Notice the uniqueness and greatness of Jesus as God's son. And church, I also believe that's hugely important because we need to know that there is one greater than us. When life punches you in the gut, bends you over, and breaks you. You need to know that Jesus is great, that Jesus can help you, that Jesus is greater than any person, any, any people. So another one of the lectionary scriptures was 2 Corinthians 4. You can turn there if you like. 2 Corinthians 4. The, the lectionary was verses 3 through 6. But this is what Paul writes in verse 5. He writes, For we do not proclaim just ourselves. We don't just tell our own stories, though those are important. We proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord and ourselves as servants for Jesus' sake. So note the difference. Jesus is great. People are here. We need to know that Jesus is great. And then later in that section, verse 8 reads, we are or we may be afflicted in every way, but not crushed because Jesus is great. Perplexed, but not driven to despair because Jesus is great. Persecuted, but not forsaken because Jesus is great. Struck down, but not destroyed because Jesus is great. Third thing that I want to bring out this morning from this Mark 9 text is to remind us that Jesus must suffer. That was part of what his work on earth was. And the connection to Elijah and Moses in Peter's recollection is that both Moses and Elijah before Jesus suffered significantly. To do God's will also means there's an element of suffering and difficulty and pain. And it I find it interesting in Mark 8, prior to this transfiguration story, Jesus is teaching that he must be rejected. The Son of Man must be rejected and undergo suffering. But Peter was disturbed by this and actually took Jesus aside and rebuked Jesus. But then... Jesus, in turn, said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. He uses the strong words because he had to stand up and recognize that suffering was a significant part of his call. We will start Lent this Wednesday, ironically on Valentine's Day, with Ash Wednesday. 
But we are entering a time of paying attention to suffering and difficulty. So then our celebration at Easter, Resurrection Day, can be that much greater. Church suffering is part of the Christian walk. It's not the only part, but it is also a part. So I'm also struck in verse 9 of Mark 9. So they're having this experience on the mountain. Jesus is transfigured, and Peter kind of says some things that don't really make sense. But verse 9 says, as they were coming down the mountain. So I have the next question, next slide. So how does one come down from the mountain? How do these guys come down from the mountain? And, and I have a few thoughts there. But before I do, I, I remember a story I was reading about professional mountain climbers. Um, and one of the concepts that they talked about when they're climbing mountains is to, to get to the top of the mountain, you can't use up all your supplies, all your reserves, all your energy just to get to the top. Because then what happens when you're at the top? If you've used up all your energy, all your resources, what's going to happen, church? You're going to die. You have to plan. You have to think about the descent, the coming down from the mountain. So for this last few minutes of, of this message, I'm borrowing some, some thoughts from a, a, a talk or a message that I delivered um, the last day of a weekend prison ministry called Kairos. And so in this, in this message, you know, I'm not going to use all the information that was there. The point was to talk to these fellows who would be these inmates who were part of the prison ministry program for that weekend, and they were fed well and treated well and, and given good attention, but to try to help them transition back to what they were going to face in the block, in the prison system, and the struggle of that, and, and how different that was from the weekend of, of interacting with us and the, and the volunteers. So, in that final talk with the fellas, one of the things we're, we said is to name, we have to go down from the mountain. Church, we also have to come down from our mountains. We have to come down into the valleys where we will inevitably encounter struggle, difficulty, and the like. This is life. In John 16, Jesus is talking and he says, in this world, in this life, you will have struggle. You have difficulty. But take heart. I have overcome them. Jesus is great. Jesus is great. So those fellas in the Kairos prison ministry that weekend, they needed to hear that, that they're going to face some struggle as they left this spiritual experience. And for some of them, it was a mountaintop experience. And we will too. I also remember saying to them, and I say to you, don't give up. Don't give up. Don't give up trying to listen and to follow Jesus, even in the face of struggle and pain and difficulty. And I say to you all, like I said to those fellas, I also said, pay attention to admitting mistakes on the journey. Pay attention to where and how you can make amends where possible. 
And also I told those fellows, and I tell you, do not neglect spiritual disciplines. Don't forget them. Don't neglect, forget the study of the scriptures or prayer or authentic Christian action. So here's a printout from that message. That's what I said. Brothers, it was just fellas in that context. Brothers, no matter where you go, no matter what you do, no matter what you've done, God will not let you go. The love of God that Jesus brought to the world now comes to us. God will not let you go. Let's pray. Thank you, God, for mountaintop experiences, even the ones that are hard to communicate about. Thank you for mountaintop experiences that help remind us that you are great and that you love us and you care for us. And thank you, God, that you go with us as we walk into life, as we come down the mountain, as we face stuff. You don't. Let us go. Thank you. I praise you with these sisters and brothers today in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen.